the their, um, that their progression of their disease was continuing. And overall, um, people said that current treatments had a positive impact on their daily life. And that may be your activities of daily living, the ability to remain independent, routine tasks, socialization, and so forth. So these were the main kind of categories of effectiveness or positive aspects of our current treatments. But I'd like to put the question back to you in the room. Are there any other positive aspects of your current treatment that you can think of that you'd like to share? Any comments from anybody? What, what do you find is positive about L-DOPA treatment? Go on then. Um, the eggs don't fall off my fork when I try to eat. You know? <laughs> um, so I guess it's some minor things like that for me. I just started L-DOPA about three months ago or four months ago. So I had this diagnosis for two years, but um, I, get, I think I respond most to the uh, feeling normal, that there's an interior feeling that you can't really, I can't really articulate very well. You, I can see my tremor go away a lot, somewhat, but more importantly for me, I feel more normal in inside. Um, mm -hmm. But I think exercise is probably a bigger deal for me than L-DOPA. If I had to give up one or the other, I might give up the L-DOPA. <laughs> right. Very interesting. Alicia. Decrease in panic attacks. Okay. Mm. What was that? A decrease, decrease in panic, panic attacks. attacks. Decrease yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. Interesting. So not from a symptom, but... From just the availability, it's it's a drug that's uh, you're not going to have to fight an insurance company for, um, so it's an yeah. easy drug to get and take compared to some of the newer ones. Right, and that's that's something that is also a, an issue because a lot of countries don't have this drug available on a consistent basis. So a lot of these positive aspects that we're taking uh, that we're talking about really aren't readily available to a large part of our population globally. Any other oh yeah I, I would say a similar theme would be uh, just the convenience. It's not it's not an infusion or an injectable. It's it's convenient and easy to take. Yeah. I have I'm scribbling notes at the same time everyone by the way. <laughs> Pretty low cost. Yeah. That comes back into the insurance question, doesn't it? Very true. Yeah. Any other benefits? The yeah. opportunity to self-manage yes. your illness too. These are all really great observations. Any more from the room? Any other comments? Okay, Sonia, back to you. <laughs> the next slide, please. So then, of course, they came the time to discuss the negative aspects of our current treatments that are available to us. And one that was really that came up quite consistently and a lot and probably one that you all relate to is the inconsistency and unpredictability of the medications that we have. The frustration that comes with not finding that optimal dosage regimen that consistently works well that we can actually count on. The variation in effectiveness, which is the second thing on this list, really had to do with brand name versus generic, what was covered, what was not covered, and the difference that people felt in, the, in terms of the effectiveness between brand name versus generic. Mm -hmm. Then we talked about the duration, onset, and off periods. And this relates to the challenges participants outlined about the delay in the onset of their medications when relief is needed immediately, as in the case of an off period where you're frozen or you can't move. So that delay in, in terms of onset was an issue. Uh, disease progression and how with time the disease pro progresses and the current medications that we have become less and less effective at controlling those symptoms for those of us that are much further along in the disease. Medication management was an issue that um, a lot of people had and that refers to the frustration of frequent dosing, the inconvenience it is to pull out your pills and take at, at you know, sometimes very short intervals, um, timing with um, meals and protein intake, all these sorts of little nuances that we really need to take into account 
when taking our medications. Um, it doesn't allow for a lot of spontaneous uh, action. And the side effects, and that's pretty self-explanatory. That's the fine balance between the relief of symptoms and the burden of medication side effects, which are sometimes worse than the symptoms that we're trying to treat in the first place. So these are um, side effects was also a very negative aspect of current treatments that people talked about. But again, to the room, are there other net negative aspects of your current treatment that you feel are not on this list or that you'd like to share with us? Any other negative? Yes. I actually feel worse, I think, I take it. It doesn't feel worse. At all. I don't have tremors or anything. I just have freezing and it doesn't make me feel good at all. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Yep. I, I think that would be the um, every time you add another drug, it's just a whole nother ripple effect that you're not sure of. So it's the uncertainty that you know the disease is going to progress. So we treat the fact that we're treating symptoms and not the disease is if you started with the levodopa and then you add ropinaril or something like that. It, you never know for sure how everything's going to mess. So it's, it's just that uncertainty of the future. Very true. Yeah. It's perfectly frantic. Um, the, how you, the progression of the disease and how your symptoms change throughout the progression of the disease, you may start off with some <laughs> symptoms and that you're getting medicine for, and then perhaps you no longer have that symptom, but you're still getting medicine for. So it's hard to discern what medicines you still need as the disease progresses because that may change and it's just really hard to figure it out. So, so the progression of the disease and how to match medication to that change. Right, and as your symptoms change, I mean, just because you may start off with tremors doesn't mean that 10 years later, tremor is still your big issue. Perhaps that subsided some as something else came and took its place, unfortunately, but Perhaps you're not having that same symptom, but yet your medicine is still dictating that you're having that. So I think there's not a good way to um, change medicines, like without going off everything and then revamping again. You know, we're just always keeping adding, let's add, let's add, let's add, but it's hard to take away. And it may be that that's not your primary complaint that's affecting your quality of life anymore. Trevor was bothering you initially in terms of your yeah, quality exactly. of life. Exactly. <clears throat> anxiety or constipation or, or something like that. Yeah. Who else has got any other comments on this? I would say the very worst side effect we've um, had is hallucinations. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, when you list side effects, that's just one of those. But that took a long time to resolve. Um, yeah. And I think that it's the impact that that in particular has on everybody around as well. Yeah, it, it's tough for the patient though, 24 hours a day, thinking someone's after you or, or being in fear. But I also found that the amount of adrenaline that came with that, um, for someone who couldn't barely walk was now running up the stairs and hiding. So the adrenaline did something yeah. to, I, it, yeah, it was a big ball of confusion. Sorry, Chad, you had your hand. Sleep issue. Okay, good to hear that raised. You know, whether you, uh, does it help you get to sleep or did you take it too soon or did I take it too late? And is it keeping me awake? You know, it's a little frustrating. Yeah. And the impact on quality of life is huge. Any other comments? <clears throat> Sonia, I think it's back to you. I'm rather enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> Very insightful, I must say, these comments. I'm really learning. Um, the next slide, please. So next topic we discussed was unmet needs. What needs to be addressed? What needs need to be addressed in order to improve quality of life, as we talked about with patients with Parkinson's disease? What issues are not being addressed? And some of you mentioned non-motor symptoms, and we all know that although this is a movement disorder, 
It is those non-motor symptoms, such as hallucinations that you mentioned, cognition, anxiety, depression, constipation, urinary urgency, sexual dysfunction, sleep, pain. These are the sort of the issues that actually really impact quality of life more significantly sometimes than the movement um, motor symptoms that we have. So the non-motor symptoms was a, a big kind of um, topic that, that we felt needed to be addressed. The second was to focus on dyskinesia because sometimes you can take this, the levodopa to a point where it becomes unbearable in terms of dyskinesia uh, side, side effects. And I know for myself that balance between having a tremor and having dyskinesia because of the medications I'm taking for my tremor, it's always, it's always difficult to juggle those two things. So the focus on dyskinesia um, participants felt was an unmet need. Focus on balance and falls. And falls are a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in those of us with advanced Parkinson's disease. So people felt, and it's not often um, addressed by things like DBS even. So these issues are, are something we felt need to focus on. Focus on vocal issues, the soft voice, the slurred speech, that ability to communicate, cognition, word finding problems, these sorts of things. Um, we felt needed more focus as well. And then the last disease progression, and we touched a little bit on this, um, some of you commented, and this was really a big one. Stopping the inevitable progression, the inevitable decline in functioning was identified as a huge unmet need for our PD community. Everything we have at the moment, as someone mentioned, is directed towards symptom control, not actually treating the disease. So creating a treatment that is disease modifying, whether that be slow the progression, stop the progression, or reverse the progression, it's hugely important, um, we felt, and was a significant unmet need for those in our community. And again, I'll turn it back to you to see if you have any other unmet needs you feel exist in our community. I have a big one that I don't know if we'll ever address, and that's public perception. Um, it's funny, it comes up a lot in our um, discussions in our Parkinson's uh, discussions about how you're perceived in some situations. Really, really an important one. Come back to that in a second, actually. Any other comments just to capture at this stage? Yep. I would say um, on that need in terms of age of the patient, <clears throat> As someone with a you know, young onset, all of the services that are provided, whether they're behavioral interventions or other, all you need to do is take the afternoon off uh, and eventually you're out of vacation because you just can't make time out of your day if you've got a day job. Avail yourself of all those opportunities. And I suppose that immediately leads into the public perception. You know, if you, if, uh, it was, a, it was a hot topic at, at World Parkinson Congress, actually, earlier in the summer in Barcelona. And there was a, a lot of discussion about um, uh, self-perception and, and then also the sort of the broader community perception of that individual. And of course, uh, you know, this is happening in every community and it's happening uh, particularly, there was a spotlight on, on some of the work that's been happening in Africa and some of the issues that have been happening. And, uh, uh, there will be an, an opportunity to see a film that's very much talking about this, that you know, Parkinson's is not witchcraft. And, and some, you know, that's an extreme example of this, but the self-perception and the, the community perception of the individual is massively important and, and hugely important on, on impact on quality of life. Sonia. I've got a couple. Oh, go on. <laughs> one, one is physical therapy. You, you need to be special, someone specialized in Parkinson's physical therapy, because plain old the physical therapy, we went to a rehab hospital here and they were not focusing on Parkinson issues. They were, so I didn't want, I don't wanna say we wasted time, but until we found the spot we needed, um, it made all the difference in the world. And the second one, hospitalization is an unmet need because many on staff do not understand Parkinson's and the need for timely meds to be given so we, we if someone's got to go in the hospital we need to make sure we educate them and be that advocate like right then and there i thought they knew yeah 
They don't. They don't. <laughs> they don't. We have a huge campaign actually in the UK, which is called Get It On Time, which is exactly about that hospitalisation piece and making sure that people are taking the medication at the time that is right for them, rather right. than the time when the ward round. Right, not an hour before or an hour after, like what they ended up telling us. In regard to that, there's um, nursing programs now are trying to incorporate education on Parkinson's to the nurses during as part of the course requirements so that that doesn't happen. So I know it's a big problem, but it's in some areas in the United States is being addressed as part of your education. And I'm sure it is. Which will right? take forever to get there. But, but we all understood. need to remember we need to be an advocate for uh, our yes, loved ones. Absolutely. Like hard advocate. Which, yeah, do you have an aware and care packet from the department? I just got it. Okay. I, I just got it because we're going for a new hospitalization, but I went to the National Institute for Health Undiagnosed Disease Network, and they didn't know that. And I didn't know, to, I had to tell them that. Yeah. So it was a real rough 48 hours yeah. for our first 48 hours. So you can't assume. Uh, I don't know if it's special to Parkinson's, maybe others could say, but just the, the need for social interaction and for uh, engagement with the world of people in the world, the public world around us. Um, I, I think that's a problem in general for those of us who are aging you know, keeping our friendships going and making new friends. Um, and I've noticed some people do much better at that naturally than other people. And um, of course, those of us who are good at it can help the others. I don't know that cinnamon is the magic trick on this, although people have testified that it does other things that might make you more open to getting out and joining groups and joining an exercise group or even engaging in like the groups uh, Alicia and I do with our uh, and others in here, you know, our monthly meetups through Corwell and other other things. So, but that takes some effort and that's not, maybe that's not unique to Parkinson's though. Maybe, maybe that's just all of everybody. I don't know. <laughs> Well, Sonia, I suppose this brings in apathy, doesn't it, and the counterbalance to apathy? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you you hit the nail on the head when you said that it may be the cinema allows us to be in a state of physical being that we can do certain things that we may not if we were symptomatic. And socialization is huge. You know, it isn't unique to Parkinson's, you're right. But in terms of there's been studies that have shown that it, decreased socialization is, leads to an increased chance of dementia, for instance. Mm. And um, so there's really significant, I watched a documentary on Netflix about centurions and, and people that live over a hundred in different communities across the globe. And one of the, the common threads was socialization. That's the people cool. that live longer and live well longer have a good social support network and they socialize with others. So it, it is a, a big, big ticket item for sure. It's certainly a, a prerequisite almost for being happy, I think. Yeah. Just you know, you're happier when you're making friends and being with your friends. Yeah, that's why I wish I was there with you guys. If you can go to the next slide, please. We took yeah. a deeper dive into the disease modification that I just, I spoke about um, when we looked at unmet needs. Um, what does it mean? What does it mean to everybody? Because um, someone alluded to our, experience of this disease is very unique and individual, depending on the age stage of, of life you're at, how quickly your symptoms are progressing, the social network that you have, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, people were saying that they would almost do anything in terms of risk for treatment if it would be disease modifying. So this was an, a big issue. If you go to the next slide, I, I wanted to talk to you about that. Do you feel an experience change in your disease and how do you measure that change? So for instance, if someone was to set up a clinical trial looking at whether a treatment was disease modifying, how would they measure that in, in terms of your life? How would they be able to tell that it was improving or not improving? I used to always think it was based on if I was doing the things that, that I had been doing before I was diagnosed, 
then the disease wasn't moving. And then I, as time went by, I started to realize that I've been adapting also. So it was kind of a downer that I have a darn thing is progressing faster because I've just adapted. So I think that's really hard, but it, it, it always, the feel experience thing is, I went into the doctor, got diagnosed, thinking really nothing was wrong with me. I, I didn't feel that bad. And I came out of there feeling like my life had changed and I felt pretty crappy. And, and so that feel experience is, is hard to, to wrestle with, I think, mm -hmm. how to quantify. Yeah. I, I know from two months later, my husband passed away and then a year later my dog died and this year my sister had a brain injury. And so every year, when those big events happen, that's what changes me a lot. So it's stress. stress. It's stress, yeah. Yeah. Ellen? Yep. I think sometimes there are short term changes too, because it kind of affects different parts of your body or how, how, how you sleep the last couple of days yeah. or what have you been doing, you know? I mean, I go take a trip or do something, stay up late. It affects me for two or three days. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think the care partner often picks it up more than the patient yep. does. Uh, so those of you who were rallying with us in 2019, we did a brilliant survey on this, and we found that care partners uh, from this community in particular, um, because it was all being driven by Team Spark, were really accurately picking up on uh, any change with their loved one with Parkinson's. And that was hugely important. And I, you know, we, we are still analyzing through that data and we will do it the paper on I promise, and we will add you all as co-authors. Um, but it's it's really important because I think that is a measure of change and how we pick up on that is, is critical. How we can make a valuable measure of that change is important. Dan, can I bring in our discussion at lunch? Would that be- Of course. Uh, perhaps you'd like to explain what happened to you and, and yeah. With, with nearly. Oh, with Neurally, um, just getting involved in the trial. And, yeah. 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 Right after I got diagnosed two years ago, I desperately looked for a trial because what you said on the previous slide, I'd do anything to slow the progression. So this was an exenatide uh, repurposed type 2 diabetes drug that was repurposed. And um, so I, I spent a year in this trial. Couldn't have been on it. I wasn't allowed to be on any medication at that time. So that's why... It's a year and a half into my diagnosis. That is to say about four months ago before I started with the L-DOPA. And so that was an interesting experience, you know, in terms of change, you think about it that way. I take this, my first L-DOPA tablet, it's a 25-100, you know, kind of the starter mm -hmm. dose. And I'm sitting in the living room and I took it. And 30 minutes later, I walked in the kitchen. I said, Jane, look. My tremor's gone. You know, I've been healed. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that way, quite the case, but um, you know, it was it was quite a quite an experience of um, of change. Um, but since then, I mean, I'm struggling with how. I guess as I, my mission, my impulse, I should say, really, is to meet other people with Parkinson's and help other people with things that I, there's things I'm good at and things I'm not good at. So I'm trying to use what I have to help other people get engaged and feel a part of a community because I know how important to my happiness, which is one gauge of change, uh, is to social experience and learning why I'm here, why I'm meeting you all. You know, this is a part, as long as I'm engaged in these kind of activities, I feel like my experience with my disease is on a positive trajectory. If these things all evaporated, we quit having this conference, Kelly quit having our monthly meetings, somehow I couldn't go to the gym anymore, somehow my friends were unavailable, I don't know. You know, it would be, it would, I would be an unhappy person again. Right now, I'm a happy person, despite the Parkinson's, you know. So, I don't know if that's the kind of thing you would. Yeah. So, Sonia, do you remember Tom saying the way he used to measure his golf, uh, measure his, his experience, his understanding of change was his golf swing? 
Yes, I do. Yeah, well, mine is carrying a cup of coffee from the kitchen to the living room with my right hand. If I can, I can gauge how my trimmer is doing because I know how close to spilling I get. You know, I can do it the left, but I test myself every morning. Sometimes I have to just drag and wipe the floor. But, you know, right. Those are all really great observations. And yes, I do the whole coffee thing. Well, mine's tea in the morning, but same thing. Um, next slide. It's our last slide. But we basically, after a, a few hours of discussion, came up with a list of what would actually be better than L-DOPA treatment if, if there were a treatment to exist. And we came up with these characteristics that we felt would really benefit us. If we could find a treatment that would be longer lasting and more predictable, that would address the non-motor symptoms that we discussed that really affect our quality of life, that minimize side effects, that are individualized. As, as people had mentioned, we our whole life experience with this disease varies from person to person and is not the same between any two people. So individualizing treatments, a, a treatment that slows or stops progression, a treatment that results in improved quality of life overall. And that's really a measure that I think is really important as, as quality of life, because that it differs for everybody. Once again, it's it's an individual's own perspective on what their quality of life is. And obviously a cure, that would be the best case scenario to get that elusive cure. So that was the, the result of our focus group um, earlier this year in terms of what's better, what would, what would the ultimate treatment be? Is there anything on there that's missing that you think? Sonia, there's one thing that yeah. struck me on this. I yeah. We're talking about slowing or stopping progression. Yeah. But because yeah. progression is such an individualized thing, how yeah. do you evaluate that change on an individual basis? And I mean, in terms of drug development, that's a nightmare because no regulator is going to go, oh, look, Sonia got better. <laughs> you know, you need to have the aggregated score. Yes, no, that, that I think is really important. And that's why I think there are certain quality of life me measurements that we can make that sort of take a little bit of that individuality into consideration. So those outcome measures might be something to look at, but I agree, it's, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack, that's for sure. Just do the cure, that'll be the simplest. <laughs> I think sometimes you're not aware of the extent of the progression of unless you um, hope withhold treatment or yeah. turn treatment off. Yeah. And, you know, it's eye opening for me when I miss a dose of my medicine yeah. and notice the return of symptoms. Yeah. Or if I'm in my doctor's office and he turns off my DBS yeah. and I really see how bad my tremor is without it, you know. I think that's very true. It's really too bad that you can't bottle the effects of a good night's sleep. <laughs> sleep is a huge, huge issue. Patrick and I were talking about that over lunch. <laughs> yeah. That progression thing is kind of like minimizing the progression of your car going. What am I trying to say? You know, your car degrades over time. If you never changed your oil, see how long your car will run, but we change our oil regularly <laughs> kind of on faith and trust in the science that it's our car's going to last longer. I mean, that's kind of what this progression is about. We, we want something that science and that we can trust is slowing it down, even if we don't have in the moment evidence that it would have, because there's no way to prove that it would have been, we would have been further down. We just trust the science is telling us you're better off with this, just like we trust car maintenance makes our car last longer. Turn the odometer backwards. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you probably have had some lectures already about things like biomarkers. And I think that's yeah. probably the right. to look at in terms of outcome measures. If we can just prove that a drug reverses a biomarker, which then, helps to stabilize the disease will be all set. Fantastic. Sonia, thank you very, very much. Indeed. My pleasure. Thank you.